Preparations are well underway as the party's conventions near. The importance of young Republican votes. A lot of our party is older. They tend to be much more socially conservative than the rest of us. Behind the scenes at Will Ferrell's political comedy. Will was always interested in John Edwards and, and it started with the hair. You don't take a swing at my hair! Who shares your values? And from the opinion desk, David Firestone on wedge issues in this year's race. I'm Rick Burke, live in the New York Times newsroom. Amazingly enough, we're just 18 days away from the Republican National Convention. Jeremy Peters is fresh off the plane from Tampa and joins me now. I got to ask you, Jeremy, we had a story a few weeks ago about the proliferation of gentlemen's clubs in right. Tampa. Did you investigate? No, well, I did, and since you're going to be approving my expense report, you should be prepared to sign off on all those receipts. Lots of tips. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I'm a very generous tipper. Okay. Um, no, but it's funny you mention that because it, it, it kept coming up. Everyone, everywhere I went, people would say, oh, the New York Times has ruined the strip club business because now no one's going to go to the strip clubs because they're afraid that bloggers and journalists will be waiting outside with their cameras or tweeting about who they just saw, Haley Barber going into the club or whoever it might be. Do you think that will really happen? <laughs> no, I think that, I, I think they'll probably do a pretty good business. Or they'll go out beyond Tampa to find the club. <laughs> anyway, let me ask you on a serious note, um, you went to the venue where the convention is. Tell us just a, what it's like. You went on a tour, you got a sneak preview. What are we gonna see down there? Well, what you're gonna see so far as they're building it out right now is a very intimate setting. They're trying to create this warmth. You know, Romney is somebody who has kind of been criticized for being very distant and aloof. And the set that they've created is meant to um, bring him and the audience close together. Uh, so they're working on that right now. And I saw it in its skeletal stages, but over the next week they're going to be building it out. And by the, uh, the end of next week, I think it'll be all done. How far along is it? And are there many people down there like working around oh, the clock? Yeah, What's no, it like? I mean, saws, buzzing, hammering going on, forklifts, hoisting electrical equipment up into the rafters. This is a big production. And how might it compare, what's your sense of how it might compare to other Republican convention venues? Well, last year, uh, or four years ago, you'll remember, it was a very spare stage. They had just that one screen uh, and a very, very small lectern on stage. It was not much there at all. Uh, this year is going to be a little bit more ornate. Uh, it's not going to be over the top, but there are definitely going to be more visual effects, more video screens. It's, it's going to be a, a more complicated affair. Yeah. Now, you had a very cool piece in the Times today and on our website about the jockeying among the also-rans to have some role at the conventions. Right. But your piece says the only person who challenged Mitt Romney who's going to have an official speaking role at the convention is Rick Santorum. Why is that the case? Well, they owed him a certain amount of respect. I mean, whatever the Romney people might think of Santorum personally, they did face a very serious challenge from him. And he was the only one who was kind of able to uh, get his delegate count up high enough that it gave the Romney campaign a little bit of heartburn. So that's a matter of just showing due respect. Is it, is it, is it just due respect, or do they think they can score politically with his supporters? I think it's both. I, I think that they want a strong social conservative voice very prominently displayed at the convention, mm -hmm. um, but they also want to spice things up a little bit. So that's why, you know, in, in the next few days, I wouldn't be surprised if we hear Sarah Palin's on the list to speak and that, believe it or not, Donald Trump is on the list to speak. Now, Donald Trump, that was hilarious in your piece when he right. boasted to you or trumpeted to you the fact that he has more tweets than any, or more followers than almost any of the other candidates. Is that, what did he tell you? I know, it's shocking, right? He's known for his modesty. Um, <laughs> what did he tell me? I, <laughs> he told me that people love him, you know, and no, no surprise there. Uh, he said that the Republican Party wants him to come, uh, even though they're not saying that publicly. But I do think that there's some truth to that. I think that A, you know, he is, he does bring ratings, but B, I think the Romney campaign feels that they owe him a small debt because he did go out and campaign for Romney in, in Ohio. And that was, you know, I don't know if it made the difference, but it certainly didn't hurt. Now, um, I know that uh, I thought that one of the most intriguing details in your piece was their ingenious idea for what to do with Newt Gingrich. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that for right, a second? Right, Professor Newt, right? right? Everybody, I mean, you covered him on Capitol Hill, you know. Long, long ago. Right? <laughs> long, long ago. <laughs> um, and he is known for <clears throat> being 
a, a very policy oriented, very kind of wonkish, and just loves to talk, loves to lecture. He was a college professor. So what the Romney campaign decided to do with him is, well, why don't we let him teach? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, great idea. Now, we're going to let you go, but just any advice for dealing with the swelter, sweltering heat for those of us going down there in a few weeks? Yes, don't ever go outside. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. They're actually going to have an air-conditioned walkway from the press center to the convention hall, <clears throat> so we won't have to worry about that. Well, thanks, Jeremy. I know you're going to be joining us a little bit later in this show, so thanks a lot. We'll talk to you in a minute. Thanks. For all the stagecraft in Tampa, one group I'm sure we're going to see on the stage is young Republicans. We may not see Newt, but we'll see young Republicans. But they approach the issues, especially social issues, a little differently. I think my earliest memory of political activity was uh, actually in 2000 when Bush was running. And I knew that my parents were voting for Bush. And at school, we had a straw poll. And I was only in second grade. But I remember it, it coming over the announcements that Bush had won our straw poll. I was like, OK, cool. Our guy won. In my junior year of high school, I heard that somebody was trying to start a teenage Republicans club, so I went and met them, and we decided to just establish a club with a teacher that agreed to sponsor us. I think that that first year of our club was a major uh, influence on me politically because I got to do a lot of cool things. I got to meet a lot of really influential people, and that really just kind of solidified my interest in politics. I mess it up every time. I definitely felt a sense of, I guess, belonging to a sort of movement that really represented what I felt. So it's easy to become passionate about it. I am pro-choice. I disagree with the Republican Party in terms of abortion and gay marriage. I've, I've always been in favor of gay marriage. I never saw any reason to be against it. In my opinion, it's not hurting anybody. And who am I to stand in the way of somebody's happiness? And I see that with a lot of the students that I'm around, a lot of the college Republicans I know, share a lot of the, the same liberal to moderate social views. And I think that that's actually changing the face of the party. I think that supporting Mitt Romney is a pretty easy choice for me, just because I found him to be the most qualified candidate solely based on executive experience and his economic background. I would actually prefer that Mitt Romney leave social issues sort of alone, because I do disagree with him on those things. While he keeps saying the first thing he'll tackle is either health care or the economy, and personally I'd prefer that he tackle the economy because I'm graduating in a couple years, I'm actually looking for a job now, and it's pretty dismal where I am. Susan Solney had a front page story today looking at this voter demographic. Now, Susan, what you went down to Charlotte, um, among other places, and you, you talked mm -hmm. to a lot of the young voters. What did the young Republicans tell you that, that struck you as different from what you might have expected? Well, I was expecting to hear a lot about social issues, particularly things like same-sex marriage and abortion, things that had been mobilizing factors for um, voters in previous elections, but I didn't hear a lot about that. So I started to ask questions about it, and the answer surprised me. For a while, I wondered whether I was at the right convention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I found a lot of support, a lot of moderation, and a lot of, quite frankly, liberal views um, on those topics that were, that were in contrast to what I thought I would hear. Then why Romney? What, what excited them about Romney? Well, that he seems to be moderate on those sorts of issues, but that he's focused so far on um, presenting himself as someone who can fix the economy. This is a generation that has really been, been hit hard on the economic front. Their unemployment rate is even higher than that for older Americans. So they want to hear someone say, we're going to create jobs. And how excited did they seem about Romney's candidacy? They seemed that they would go out and work for him, but a lot of them did say that they had supported other candidates in the primaries and that they had come around to supporting I, him. Because I wonder, like, four years ago when you covered a lot of voters and you talked to a lot of the young Obama supporters, there seemed to be a really outcry of right. support for him. It seemed to come from the heart and the soul, right. and that didn't really seem to be the case here. Th this is more practical right. for their own lives and careers, yeah, and they're yeah. thinking... I think they're trying to cast a wide net, too, and they're hoping to bring in that liberal, um, I mean, the libertarian um, aspects right. of the party, the supporters of uh, Ron Paul and and other people who have more moderate views. Now, if we look at polling, most of these under 30 voters are probably going to vote Democratic, right? So, yeah. I mean, so how serious is the effort by the Romney campaign, by the Republican Party, to win them over mm -hmm. in November? This is a group that voted for Obama by a margin of 2 to 1 in 08, and Republican youth had one of the lowest turnout levels in the 2008 election in the history of 
presidential elections. And they had not come out in strong numbers for the primaries either. So there is a real effort to get them to the polls. They don't expect to win the youth vote, but if they can just shrink the margin I between um, Romney and Obama, they'll be happy. And they think that can make a difference in some of the crucial swing states. Great. Susan, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Now, Jeremy Peters, our friend from a couple minutes ago, is back with yet another appearance. He recently sat down with movie director Jay Roach, whose politics-themed comedy starring Will Ferrell opens tomorrow. Oh, look at this. Look at this, okay? 62% of the people that got asked liked you, okay? Then the phone call happened. Then they asked the same question. Now only 46% of the people like you. Run through it one more time. These spend doctors, you know, kind of draft the, the candidates almost like casting and they give them a huge amount of advice and instruction and shove them out on the stage and then sort of try to edit <laughs> their performance as best they can. And it's, there's a, there's a, you know, an embarrassing amount of overlap between, uh, you know, what we do uh, making films and what they do and uh, propping up, you know, national candidates these days. Hate to break it to you, friend, but uh, your balloon's getting ready to pop. You know, despite its silliness and crudeness, you're making some pretty damning points about the state of American politics, aren't you? <laughs> uh, we're, we're aware that uh, there may be a connection between what we're doing in real life. Well, as a Christian, I guess that it would be easy for you to recite the Lord's Prayer. Is that what we're resorting to here? Gestapo tactics? We studied a bunch of campaign ads before we started making this. One of my favorites was the demon sheep ad. Fiscal conservative. And that was like a U.S. Senate campaign, and we worried sometimes that we couldn't go far enough to, to, uh, to actually be exaggerated. Comedy likes exaggeration. I'm wondering if you could tell us maybe some of the uh, political malfeasance that might have inspired you. Well, Will was always interested in John Edwards, and, and it started with the hair. Oh, you don't take a swing at my hair! It just seems to be a, a pattern among certain um, politicians that they get caught up in these, uh, you know, scandals. I wanted to take this time to say that we're going to be under a lot of media scrutiny. We were inspired by um, Herman Cain during the GOP primaries who was caught in a scandal and then had his poll numbers go up. <laughs> that became a factor in our story as well. Uh, I haven't yet seen a riot break out in the middle of a debate, but it doesn't seem that far from those sort of town hall uh, near riots that happened in 2008. You had the you, I'm speaking. I'm paper, speaking. With politics being as polarized as it is right now, is there something of a release valve in seeing a film like this for Americans yeah. who may just be tired of the political system? I look at it as therapeutic. I honestly worry for our system. I'm, I'm as jaded and cynical as you might think we are because we're doing this kind of film. Where I'm at least also idealistic and very aware of what I wish it could be and what it what it is and how different those two things are. The movie opens tomorrow, and a review from Times film critic Tony Scott will be online around 4 o'clock this afternoon. Um, I, I have to tell you, I read it, and they won't let me tell you what it says if it's thumbs up or thumbs down, but I tell you this, it's a fun read, so definitely check it out. That's all for me. Um, Op-ed columnist Charles Blow is standing by now with editorial board member David Firestone. Thanks, Rick. That's right. I'm here with David Firestone from the editorial board. So, David, um, the last couple conversations I've had, I've had with columnists. A lot of people know them. It just explains to us very briefly how the board is different sure. from columnists. Well, the columnists, as you know, speak for themselves. The, uh, the board speaks for the paper. Not the news side that you see back here, but the kind of the institution of the Times. And that's why the editorials are unsigned. Even though they're obviously written by individuals, they're considered the product of the full board. And, uh, and it's kind of the, the voice of the uh, paper speaking about issues. I, I just love the, word, the way the board sounds so awesome. Right. So, Less let, awesome when you're actually in the room. <laughs> but. So let's get into it. Let's get into politics. Um, you and I both blogged today about Mitt Romney uh, and the welfare issue and him basically uh, accusing President Obama of trying to gut the welfare provisions of the, the work requirement. And there was an editorial on this today. Explain to our viewers why we wrote those 
what is wrong with what Mitt Romney is saying and what the real issue is here. The, uh, the administration issued some waivers on uh, the work uh, requirement for uh, welfare, which goes back to 1960, 1996, the Clinton administration. Um, the conservative uh, groups immediately claimed this was a way to uh, get out of the work requirement. In fact, if you start to look at the actual details, what the administration did was allow states at their request, the state's request, to uh, find ways to approach the work requirement differently, as long as they could bring more people into actual jobs. And many of the people requesting were Republican governors. That's right. right? And That's at, right. And, at, and at a certain point, Romney, when he was governor of Massachusetts, had requested something of a waiver, maybe not the exact same Not waiver, this exact one, right. But waivers uh, to the, the welfare program as well. Is that exactly. right? Exactly. So where does this go? I mean, this is like another wedge issue, maybe like the at least a third in the last two weeks. First, there was... Um, the Romney campaign suggesting that the Obama administration was suing in Ohio to prevent veterans from having the right to early vote. Right. Just today, the Romney campaign issued um, an advertisement that basically said that Ob the Obama campaign was using the health care law to attack uh, religion in America. Why? these wedge issues now on the verge of a VP pick, on the verge of the convention? These are classic Republican uh, tactics. Um, welfare, for example, is something that we've seen going back decades. Um, and the military uh, is a way to kind of uh, uh, excite uh, the many, many military members who are um, uh, tend to vote Republican. Um, I think it indicates that the economic argument that they have been making, that the Romney campaign has been making for a while, isn't as effective as they thought it would be. They're kind of stuck around 48, 49 percent. They had really hoped to be higher by now. And, uh, and so they're going back to a really tried and true and frankly cynical uh, approach um, to uh, increase participation of blue collar voters and divide uh, one side from but, another. But is, it, is that a, a workable tactic to increase that margin? Because now you have to, to get above the base, you have to get into independent voters. It, are these wedge issues the kinds of issues that play well among independent voters in America? I don't think so. I mean, I think this is a very tired approach. Um, that, uh, that most um, voters are pretty happy with the way the welfare system, for example, is working now. Uh, and they don't really feel that this is an issue that affects their lives. Um, and uh, I, I just have a feeling that it will look as manipulative to voters as it, in fact, is. Manipulative? I, I mean, I suggest panicky, but that's just me. Right. But it, it, to me, it suggests a certain level of desperation because you know, what Mitt Romney has hung his entire candidacy on is this idea that he was a chief executive, that he did well in business, that he knows the economy better than Barack Obama. And in fact, if you look at the polling, the only area where Mitt Romney does better than Barack Obama is on the economy. So if you start to turn eyes away from your experience on the economy into issues of who shares your values, well, Barack Obama actually wins on that if you look at the Gallup polling. Right. You know, I don't understand the, the philosophy of the the Romney campaign at this point to to pit, to throw over the side of the ship his one and only high point. I wouldn't say they're throwing it over completely. Um, I think they're trying to add to it because they're finding that it's just not as effective, or it's reached its maximum effectiveness. So it's tapped out. It, it may be. I mean, uh, we still haven't seen the full brunt of their post-convention spending, obviously, uh, in which they're going to really uh, start attacking the, uh, the president much more forcefully than we've seen so far. Nonetheless, I think they're, they're starting to add a few new uh, arrows to, to their quiver because they're not convinced they can do it with the single arrow that they had before. So, so j just to wrap up, is there a possibility that these things are not, in fact, baked in any cake? That we have had this president for three and a half years. We don't know him well enough to say that we know all these things that you are attacking him on and whether we like them or we don't like them or can they get any mileage in your opinion out of a full-throated wedge issue negative campaign these issues are ones that um, i think will impress the base that he already has uh, when he talks about defense cuts 
Um, I mean, most of the, of the folks who care deeply about that are clearly on Romney's side already. Will he get independent voters and really push his margin a little bit higher? I'm not sure that this is going to work. I think what he really needs to do and is what he hasn't, and that's come out with some details of an economic plan instead of the really thin shell that he has put forward so far. We don't know much about what he would actually do to the economy. You heard it here. David Firestone wants details. Mitt Romney and Joe do I. That's it for today. See us back here next week, and we'll do this all over again. Thank you.